going to be talking about a couple things today. I'm going to uh, talk about things lost and things found, and I'm going to talk about demystifying the creative process. To begin, I have to start with a question um, about events in our lives. How many of you have had either something really amazing happen or something really opposite? I hope the high school students have never had big tragedies yet. Probably mostly amazing things occur. How many of you have had some real big events in your lives? The whole room. Okay, good. Uh, they say that we're not defined by these events, but we're defined by how we respond to these events. So it's not the events in our lives, but it's our response to the events that defines us. And I've had a lot of major events in my life. As Sam said, uh, I collect certain things. Um, seems to be that I've been collecting concussions. I've had nine major concussions uh, after 10 years of age, which you're not supposed to have. So for those of you in high school, just remember, no, no more concussions if you're on any sports teams. You're only supposed to have three in your adult life. Uh, my last concussion in 2008 was pretty serious, and it took a lot away from me. Um, I lost a lot of things. I lost some superpowers, as I call them. I think that each of us are born with uh, certain abilities, um, not that we can fly or jump over buildings in a single leap, um, but that we do have superpowers, things that we do better than others, things that we find that are more akin to ourselves than other people, things that, were, that are part of our nature. Um, when I was a little boy, I started drawing, and I studied drawing formally from the age of nine forward. Now, unfortunately, I've decided not to show any of my art today, because you can go and see it online. And I remember from talking before, it's actually better just to be up here speaking and not showing too much. So if you want to see what I do and see that I'm not lying and telling the truth, I do or did actually draw quite a lot. But in 2008, when that car hit me and I suffered my ninth concussion, um, when I came out of it, a lot of things had changed. I'd lost that superpower, that ability to draw, um, I couldn't talk at the time. I couldn't remember quite who I was, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, it was actually kind of funny because my best friends told me that for some reason I seemed a lot nicer. Now, I don't know how to take that from the people that I know really well, having them say that, you know, you're a lot nicer since that concussion, since you don't remember who you were. Um, but I also went on a path of discovery to try and regain these things. Of course, to begin to talk again was important to get my speech back. The doctors told me that I would never get my ability to speak with higher words, um, complex words like I'm using now, like the word complex. They said that I wouldn't get those back, and I probably wouldn't get a lot of the abilities that I now have back, and I told them that that wasn't true. I was going to start the next day to get those back. Um, it took about four years of work to do this. But what I began to do to get these things back is part of the creative process and how I understand the creative process and what I'm here to talk about with you. Before the accident, um, I thought of myself not as an artist but as a painter. When people would ask me if I was an artist, I would say no because I thought being called an artist was pretentious and I'd say I was a painter. Not that that's any less pretentious to call oneself a painter versus an artist. But I define myself by thinking that, as a painter, that's where my creativity come from, came from, how I saw myself. And when I lost that ability to paint, and when I lost that ability to draw, I thought that somehow I had lost my ability to be creative. Um, it was not very long into the injury when I realized that I had to do some things to get these abilities back, to be able to talk, to be able to use my memory again, to be able to look in the mirror and recognize that strange guy that was staring back at me who I didn't know. Um, and what I did is I, I developed these very funny things. I, one night before I went to bed, right as I was going to sleep, I had this idea, this little eureka moment. And before I explain that, I want to ask you, how many of you get these eureka moments, these sudden flashes, these ideas that come to you when you're studying for a paper, when you're trying to figure out an answer to a problem, and you're doing something completely different and all of a sudden you get the answer or an idea for something. How many of you do that? Oh, there's a room full of hands again. Now, how many of you do that when you're doing something completely different, like driving down the road or, or playing a sports game or doing something that's completely separate from the activity that you're involved in trying to answer? Okay, hopefully it's not driving because I don't want to get hit again. Um, <laughs> 
But that's, we call that detachment, when you're not engaged in the process that you're trying to understand or the thing that you're working on, and you come up with the solution. So right as I was falling to sleep, I had this eureka moment. The problem with our eureka moments is that we don't hold on to them. We don't understand the validity of them. Sometimes we have these great ideas, these wonderful inspirations, and we're not sure whether they're really something that we should hold on to or not, and we fall asleep, we forget about them, we don't jump out of bed, especially in Maine in the middle of winter when it's really cold, and write them down or stop our car, pull it over and write them down. But that eureka moment that I had was a strange one. I saw myself speaking into a computer while reading the New York Times, listening to the New York Times audio and videotaping myself. So I woke up the next day and I began to do that, first with just a word and then with sentences over and over and over again, much to my girlfriend's dismay because she had to hear me reading first one word over and over and then a sentence over and over, and this went on for about a year until I could get full sentences and full paragraphs back. By the time I got to speech therapy, I was talking again, and they said, wow, you're doing really good. Um, how did you do this? And I explained, and they said, well, where'd you get this idea? And it was at that point that I began to remember some things that I had done before the accident. I had been involved in studying creativity and the creative process, and how as artists or as just individuals, we understand and engage in creativity. And I remembered a lot of things all of a sudden. I'd remembered reading Plato's Theotetus, which is about philosophical midwifery, which is the seven steps that a philosophical midwife goes into delivering an idea. I remembered sitting on a mountaintop in Wyoming talking to Murray Gelman, who's the Nobel laureate physicist who discovered the quark, and having him say that they were involved in the research to understand the creative process. And he said, you know, we found that there's seven steps. And I said, really? And he began to name the steps, and when he got to the third one, I named the other four, and he goes, where did you get those? I said, from this old dialogue by Plato called the Theotetus. And he goes, you know, we've been researching those for the last couple of years down at the Institute in Santa Fe. And these steps are really important to talk about, and that's what I'm going to explain now. Now, that eureka moment is the fifth step. And these seven steps that we have don't have to happen in a particular order. In fact, sometimes we often get this eureka moment, and so we have to go back and unpack it and understand it. But if you don't get that sudden flash, if you don't have those little sparks of ideas, then what you have to do is start with the first step, which is framing a question, coming up with a way of stating the problem or understanding the question, and framing the question for yourself so you can begin to go into the second step which is the most important, I say this about each step, that it's the most important thing. Um, I'm not going to tell the same story I told before, but I'm just going to say that, you know, we always say that we can have one thing that's really important to us or one thing that's really special. I always call everything the most important, the most special, because I feel that I can have as many special things or as many important things as I want. So this step is the most important step, like all the other ones. Um, the second step is research. What we have to do is begin to research around the question or around the idea. And this kind of research can be anything. As an artist, we might look at imagery, we might look at color and shape. As a musician, we'd hear sounds and remember sounds. If we're cooks, we'd go smell and taste things. But we gather inspiration from the world around us through our research. Now, the scientist does the same kind of research in scientific investigation. They look at the problem from different angles. They, they, they gather data around it. They accumulate all this data, and they get to the fourth or the third stage, which, again, is the most important stage. But it's the stage of saturation, where you say, OK, I've had enough. It's time to stop. Now, none of us really do this very often. Sometimes we research so much that we exhaust ourselves completely. And research can happen from 20,000 feet out, where you see the problem in general, or when you're lost down in the weeds. But at some point, you have to say, that's enough. Now it's time to stop. And then you go to the fourth stage, which, again, is the most important stage. And this is a stage of gestation, where you go into a stage where you just want to hold the problem, and you want to stay with the problem, and you want to be able to keep the problem with you and walk around in a state of what we call detachment. Now, I talked about this before, and I'm going to go back to explain what that detachment is. That state of detachment is very important. <laughs> Again, one of the most important things. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my past. I grew up in Southern California. Uh, when I was 16, I had a sensory deprivation tank. 
I won't explain it, but for about four years, three years, I went in that tank every night instead of sleeping. Now, that's part of being a Southern Californian, being a little odd. I also went to a Zen center from the age of 16 to 25, and I would study Rinzai Zen. And part of Rinzai Zen was koan study, where you'd be given an impossible question, a question you couldn't answer. And the typical question that we know from all movies and films is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? It's a question that has no answer. Um, when we do studies in logic, we call these questions wicked questions. Now, it's not a main thing. A wicked question is a question that just has multiple answers or no real answers to it, but allows you to open yourself up to think about things. So when you're, in this, when you're studying Zen and you practice this detachment, you do anything else but think about the question. You sweep the garden, you cook, you do all other kinds of things. Now, in the creative process, in this fourth step, we have two things. We call it detachment, which is to engage in anything else but the thing you're working on, or the use of metaphor, to use metaphors to think about things. Like if you're looking at a mathematical equation, your metaphor might be to think about a tree rather than about that equation. And while you're doing these things, while you're engaged in the process of detachment, while you're wondering about everything else except the problem you're working on, you get these sudden flashes, these eureka moments, these ahas, where all of a sudden you get the answer to the question. Now, how many of you have had that happen? Where you let go of where you've been working on a problem so hard that you're so frustrated, you're overwhelmed, you finally let go, you allow yourself to do something else, and all of a sudden you come up with an answer. It's hard in high school, I know, because you're under so much pressure to get things done on time. It doesn't get any easier when you get out of high school or out of college. In fact, it probably gets harder. But that fifth stage, again, the most important, it probably really is the most important, is that eureka stage, where you get the idea, you get the answer, and then you have to go into the sixth stage. And the sixth stage is one of the hardest stages, and it's one of the stages where most of us fall short. That sixth stage is that stage of actually bringing the idea of into being, of making the thing, of writing that paper, of putting that poem down, of putting that song down, of forming that sculpture, of doing that thing that we set out to do. And that's the stage where most of us often fail. And we fail because we're afraid. We're afraid that the thing that we make might, make might be rejected. We're afraid that the thing that we do might um, not be accepted by those around us. We're afraid that it might not be as good as the last thing that we did. Often we do something, and we're so proud of it when we finally get it done that we're afraid to do the next one because, darn, if it won't be as good as the last thing that we did. And artists operate from the state of fear all the time. They have to overcome that fear in order to engage the next thing. But all creatives do this, whether we're an artist, whether we're a scientist, whether we're an economist. When we come up with an idea, a good idea, a really sound idea, and when we bring that idea into being, making that next idea is the hardest thing. And the final stage, the most, again, the most important stage, and I say this about all of them, is giving that idea to the world, either sharing it in terms of a critical process where you allow people to question the idea or look at the thing that you made and ask if it's good enough and be able to accept whether it is or isn't, and then to bring that idea out into the world and share it with others. So the last thing I'm going to say is that all of you are creative, and all of you will have these eureka moments, and challenge yourself to bring these things into being and then to share them with the world. Thank you very much for having me up here.